a closer walk with the tennis court. Oh, yeah, you definitely can go with that. Yeah, what, what does tennis court? Did you, did you? Just a closer walk. What do you think? Mr. Mad? Who did these court lifts? I think I'll start out the, just the initial stuff with the bounce run, so. These court lifts are fine. Why don't we do a sound check? So let's do a sound check. I'll do it. I don't know this guy, but it's like under my mask now.
Welcome to Eureka First United Methodist Church, where we are live online and where we are drawing the circle wide enough to include you this morning. Let's sing.
Recently, George Floyd reminded us how important our breath is. <laughs> and we know that from the Bible, because in the book of Genesis, God breathes into Adam the breath of life. And then in the Gospel of John, the risen Jesus, what we call the new Adam, breathes into his disciples the breath of new life. So I want you to close your eyes, uncross your legs, put your hands in your laps, and breathe slowly, deeply. And imagine that every breath is God's breath, filling you, healing you, renewing you. And hear these words of Jesus. Peace be with you. As the Abba has sent me, so I send you. May the peace of Christ be with you. You will have the chance to share that um, peace at our coffee hour on Zoom at 11. I know you've been missing the coffee and the donuts, and we can recreate that online. So we had a couple people join last week, and we hope to have more this week. You can join by computer or tablet or phone, or if you can't deal with any of that, just dial the number on your telephone, and you can join us by audio. While we are gathering, I hope we will talk about um, our worship going forward. I think the, the change in pastors put us back a few weeks in terms of figuring out some of the technological challenges of online worship. So we will be talking in the weeks to come how to upgrade our technology. In the meantime, I think there are ways that we can add music back and singing back into our worship services. So, if you have a talent to share, I hope that you will find a way to record at home and um, share that digital file with us so that we can insert that into our worship service and we can all share in your love of music. So let us, let me know if you um, would like to try to give that a try and we'll, we'll figure out how to make that happen. In the meantime, um, there are a couple of uh, opportunities for us to gather and to go a little deeper in faith. On August 11th, um, my husband Hank and I will be starting a Bible study on the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, I gotta keep moving the slide, sorry. <laughs> and uh, we are going to be looking at the sermon from the Global South. And so we're calling our study from the margins to the center. And we're going to be looking at how marginalized communities, especially in the developing world, read the scripture. Because they do it from a very different social context than we do. And I think their understandings can really enrich ours. And then I'm going to um, throw out there the opportunity to have a some kind of a support group or um, just a... a good, healthy living group to help us get through uh, the coronavirus crisis. I don't know what to call it yet. It, it might be the covenant, or COVID covenant group. It might be the soul strength support group. It might be Eureka first steps into wholeness and health. Or I was thinking maybe OHB, optimizing health during the coronavirus. I don't know. But <laughs> But um, I'm interested in that mind-body connection thing, and I would like to share my resources with you and, and would like you to share your resources with me so we can be healthy physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally in the weeks and months to come. I want to also um, just give a shout out to Bill and Barbara O'Brien one more time. Uh, they were. They continue to paint their way around the church building, and they were out yesterday uh, power washing that wall that Barbara is scraping there. So uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for their uh, continued work on our building. 
once we get the exteriors looking great, we can pray that people will get to see the interior in the not too distant future. And then finally, I want to remind you, we haven't had anyone send in uh, photos of what they are doing. So we'd like, um, especially for me who don't, don't know all of you yet, I would like to see what you're doing this summer and how you're um, recreating or just, just um, resting. And send in your song requests and prayer requests. And uh, with that, let's go to a song, The Hymn of Promise. Earthquakes, a 
okay, that's something I'm a little bit scared of. <laughs> and I hear that earthquakes are a thing around here. <laughs> so, can earthquakes separate us from the love of God? No, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Let's see. Going to school online. Boy, that can separate us from our teachers, that can separate us from, from our friends, that can separate us from not learning anything. <laughs> but can it separate us from God? No. no, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Let's see. Not getting to go to camp or to Disney World or to all those fun things we thought we were going to do this summer. Is not having any fun going to keep us separated from the love of God? No. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Oh, here's one. Missing my grandma. So my, my daughter's grandpa is turning 90 years old on August 4th. And we don't get to go celebrate with him. Am I missing my dad? You bet I am. But can that separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? No. All right. One more. The virus. Okay. The virus is separating us from the people we love. It's separating us from the things we want to do and the places we want to go, but can the virus separate us from the love of God? Absolutely no. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, we do thank you that you keep all of our bad in a bag, in your bag, and that nothing on this earth, nothing in life or in death, can separate us from you. Remind us of that in these summer, long summer days and going into the fall. And as we try to connect to our friends and stay in contact with our families, help us to remember that your love is surrounding them as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Awesome God, how wonderful are your works. How righteous are your deeds. How powerful is your love. And yet, how blind we are to your grace as we huddle in our prisons of impossibility, help us to see your promise. As we complain about our immobility, prepare us for your journey. In this place of brokenness, teach us to embrace our options for wholeness. Give us, Lord, hope for transformation. Give us the courage to take the risk of redemption. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, here as we lift up the dates of all the persons and situations on our hearts today. For the family of Douglas Clayton, who died on July 14th for that family as they grieve in isolation. Lord, in your mercy. And for Louis and Paula Amato, uh, Louis uh, fell at Winco and really banged up his face and lost a tooth and, and is, is feeling uh, a little unsteady. But, um, and is trying to care for Paula. So uh, prayers and um, concerns go out to the Amado family. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 
Here are our variables. And for Tim, who's undergoing radiation, and uh, I saw him this week, and he says he's halfway through, and he's doing okay so far. So we pray that he continues to do well. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, hear our prayers. prayers. And prayers for Holly Klingel as she recovers from surgery. She's awaiting tests from the biopsy, but um, she is doing well so far. So continue to hold her in prayer. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. And for Shirley Peterson, who underwent her tests and now is just waiting for results. So as she anxiously awaits a call from her doctor, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. And for Jesse and Vicki Grammer, uh, they are recovering from the car accident. No serious injuries, but they're a little sore. And um, their car was totaled, so prayers for them as they figure out literally how to move forward. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Hear our prayers. prayers. And we pray, we lift up Brad Johnson. Dorothy came this morning to uh, add Brad to the prayer list. He's been in a lot of pain since Wednesday because of some orthopedic insoles and uh, prayers for his patients and for uh, Dorothy as well. <laughs> Lord, in your mercy. Here are our prayers. prayers. And then we lift up those who are unemployed or who have lost their health insurance or who are worried about being evicted um, in this coming month. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. And for those who are struggling with addiction issues and mental illness, and for our seniors who are beginning to lose hope in this time of social isolation, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Hear prayers. prayers. And for all of our educators, and for parents, and for the students, as decisions are being made about school this fall. Lord, in your mercy. And now hear us as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, uh, uh. You know, when we join the church, we pledge to support the church through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Well, we can't support the church through our physical presence, but we can support the church with our financial gifts. And so I thank you all in advance for what you do.
scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the eighth chapter. And I'm going to be reading uh, various verses from this chapter, which is one of my favorite in all of scripture. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the pearl of great price. Hold on to it. of this present time. Our ears perk up, don't they? For there is plenty of suffering going on in our time. It does seem as if the whole creation has been groaning, and we have been groaning right along with it. And I think we are less sure than we once were that we're going to make it. So while you and your loved ones wait with eager longing to be set free from this virus, let me tell you a story. This is my personal testimony. 
And I tell it for a couple of reasons. One is so that you'll know how my brain works and sometimes doesn't work. <laughs> but I also tell it in the hopes that it will help you locate the love of God in your own life. Despite the times we are in and the suffering we are enduring. One day, when I was 18 months old, I had a fever and I didn't wake up from my nap. My parents, terrified, rushed me to the Des Moines Children's Hospital where I went into convulsions and then into a coma. The doctors did a spinal tap. It was meningitis. Massive doses of sulfa and penicillin saved my life. And other than having to learn how to walk and talk all over again, everything seemed to be fine. Until I was about the age of 12, when I started having strange deja vu experiences and anxious butterfly feelings in my stomach. The pediatrician told my mother, it's a pre-migraine condition, but I never had a headache. And then one Christmas break, my older sister came home from college. She was talking to me, but I didn't answer her. I was out of it for almost a minute. I didn't know it then, but I was having a complex partial seizure. I never blacked out. I just went into an altered state of consciousness, even without drugs. <laughs> My junior year in high school, I was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. And that began a very long odyssey of doctor visits, blood draws, EEGs, CAT scans, MRIs, and a whole litany of mood altering, sleep inducing, nauseating drugs, none of which stopped the seizures. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Well, I can't say that I was very patient, but I was young enough to be hopeful, and somehow I got through high school. I kept riding horses. I graduated second in a class of 640 got a full scholarship to Boston University. Things were really looking up for me. But while I was in college, the seizures kept getting more frequent. And I began getting more and more depressed. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought. You see, I had a problem. I didn't believe in a God who would cure some people and let others suffer. So I never once allowed myself to pray for the seizures to go away. Because my God doesn't work that way. Nevertheless, I still tried to pray. I prayed for strength. I prayed for hope. Thank goodness that the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Well, it's a long story. I got my call to ministry. I went to seminary. I kept trying different meds, but I didn't get any different results. The seizures kept coming. I was ordained. I was appointed. And in the summer of 1989, I found myself pastor of Filer United Methodist Church in Filer, Idaho a town of about 1,700 people nestled along the Snake River, six miles west of Twin Falls on Old Highway 30. I was 24 years old, living alone in the parsonage with uncontrolled complex partial seizures and no car. Well, my very first official act as a minister was a wedding on the Saturday before my first Sunday, and I had a seizure in the middle of the ceremony. 
Now, I had taken the maid of honor aside during the rehearsal, and I told her what she needed to do and not do for me, if that were to happen, and by the grace of God, she was a nurse, and she already knew. So at the outdoor barbecue reception at the family dairy farm, the bride's parents toasted me, and the beauty of grace dawned on me. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. There were other seizures in the pulpit, which is why to this day I preach from the manuscript <laughs> on account of my brain injury. I learned that there were no seizure specialists in the entire state of Idaho at the time. So my dad found a doctor for me at Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland. And I enrolled in an experimental implant study. The company that was funding the research flew me to Portland once a month. And for the first time in my life, I had a neurologist with a good bedside manner. I became a lifetime member of the Dr. Martin Zielinski Fan Club, not because he promised me a cure, but because he gave me hope. Even after the experimental implant failed, and then after the experimental drug failed, because at some point, at every visit, he found the opportunity to assure me, remember, you have options. Now the option he had in mind for me was a right temporal lobectomy, which seemed a bit drastic to me. <laughs> After all, I was pretty high functioning, and this wasn't a life or death situation. Except that, to be honest, I was living a kind of death. You see, I was letting myself be defined by my disease. And yet, while I was very frustrated with my life situation, I wasn't all that excited about taking the risk to change it. But you know, it wasn't the surgery that I was most afraid of. For I had been told I would almost certainly survive it. It was the unknown aftermath that really scared me. But I went ahead. I spent a week in the hospital for tests. I had to fly to UCLA for a PET scan because there were only two machines on the West Coast at the time. And that's how they found the scar tissue that was causing the seizures. It had been there in my right hippocampus since the meningitis all along. So then in May of 1993, I had a 10 centimeter section of my right temporal lobe removed. The physical recovery was quick and relatively easy. I was back to work in full time in six weeks. The emotional recovery was another matter altogether. Dr. Solinsky's prophetic words came back to haunt me. You may have more trouble learning to live without epilepsy than you think. All of a sudden, a life that had had too few options was completely overwhelmed by them. Because so much of my identity had been wrapped up in sickness. And I didn't know who I was now that I was well. All those excuses that I had for not being everything I had wanted to be, were suddenly stripped away. I felt like a very different person. Every morning, I woke up wondering, who am I going to be today? It was exhausting, for it seemed that I had to do everything as if for the first time. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? 
It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. You know, in all these years as a Christian, that was the first time that I had to pray just to get through the day. But unlike my pre-surgery days, I was now keenly aware that God was with me. Because one morning, while I was sitting on my bed, reading my Bible, Christ came to me. It was kind of like a dream. I couldn't actually see anything, but I knew. I just knew that someone was standing there next to me. And what's more, I felt something like a hand on my shoulder, comforting me. It was that presence, that undeniable presence that said to me, you may not have known it, but I was there all alone. And I'm here with you now. Nothing can separate you from my love. Not epilepsy, not brain surgery, not this recovery, not your anxiety. I had only known what options God had in store for me. In that first year of recovery, I got my driver's license, and a member of my new church in Eugene gave me a car, an 81 Chrysler New Yorker. <laughs> On the second anniversary of the surgery, I was still seizure-free. I was finally medication-free. And I was head over heels in love with a Brooklyn-born Jew, practicing as a Roman Catholic, working as a Native American linguist. <laughs> By the third year, I was married. I would made the decision to go back to school and was preparing to move to Berkeley. Seven years later, I became a mother. And 15 years after receiving my permanent head damage, in surgery, I got a PhD in theology. It took me a long time, but I finally learned that nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. And that helped me through the doctoral studies, through a devastating church fire in Santa Cruz, and raising a teenage daughter. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and it gave me the courage to face yet another health crisis. In 2015, after 22 years of the most excellent health, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was the senior pastor at Willow Glen in San Jose, and without taking a leave, I worked through the surgery, I worked through the chemotherapy, I worked through the radiation, through a year of infusions, and coming up on five years of oral medication. I kept running in the redwoods, slower and slower, even though there were many, many times that I felt exhausted, beaten down, and hollowed out. And yet never once did I feel that God was not with me, nor that Christ was not with me. And you know, that was enough for me. Dr. Selinsky had taught me that we all have options. While we can't always choose our situation, we can choose what we do with it. And God taught me that even when faced with death or something that feels like it, we can choose life, knowing that we have already been chosen by love. So who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Don't we imagine all kinds of things that get between us and the love of Christ? The sicknesses in our minds and in our bodies and in our souls 
and in our society, they have a way of convincing us that there is no way that God could love us or no way that God could ever care for us. But you know, that's the really big lie, isn't it? To which the Apostle Paul says a very big no. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I didn't really believe it until I experienced it for myself. But even I am now convinced, and I hope to convince you, that neither fear of death nor fear of life, neither chronic diseases nor natural disasters, neither divisive politics nor runaway pandemics, neither systemic poverty nor racial oppression, neither our regrets about the past or our anxieties about the future. No, nothing, absolutely nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I hear it? Amen. 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 Let's sing your song of life. chosen us by love. 
we have the grace to choose life. Let us be prayer. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. For it is right always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God, for you set before us two options, life and death, and encouraged us to choose life. Too often we have chosen the alternative. We have failed to see the options for wholeness, our chance for wellness, and your path to holiness. But still, you do love us. And you keep speaking your word to us by your prophets, your apostles, your martyrs, and your missionaries. And then your word of love became flesh in your Son, our Savior, who came preaching the good news to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, liberty to the oppressed. And you came announcing the time had come when you would save your people. By your baptism into his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself for us, he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here. And on these gifts of the bread and the fruit of the vine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heaven. By your Spirit, or through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
nourishing our spirits with your presence. With the bread and the cup, you fill us up with the life of your Son and the healing power of your Holy Spirit. And you give us new options for holiness and wholeness in a world that needs us. We pray as we live in the name of Jesus. Amen.